Heavenly Father, bless us this morning as we hear your word. Open our ears to listen carefully. Open our minds to understand. And open our hearts to receive your word with gladness and give your word a home in our lives each and every day. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Old Testament lesson comes to us this morning from the prophet Isaiah reading in chapter 5, the first seven verses. <clears throat> Listen now to the word of God. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it with stones and planted it with the choicest vines. <coughs> He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Thanks be to God. The New Testament lesson comes to us this morning from the Gospel according to Luke, reading in chapter 12 and beginning with verse 49. Listen now to this word from God. I came to cast fire upon the earth and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with and how I am constrained until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For henceforth in one house there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against her mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He also said to the multitudes, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming. And so what happens? And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? Here is this reading from the word of God. I hope that I do not mispronounce anything too badly here. I'm going to be quoting Robert Burns. In his poem, To a Mouse, Robert Burns wrote this famous line. The best laid schemes of mice and men gang off the glide. How'd I do? Okay. Which is often quoted as the best laid plans of mice and men often go astray, or something similar to that, how true that is. Almost 60 years ago, the American president and members of Congress, mostly Democrats, declared war on poverty. They passed legislation that was supposed to relieve poverty in America. The plan was apparently supposed to provide enough government assistance to raise people up out of poverty. I would suppose that the instigators of this plan believed that once people received help to escape poverty, 
they would then take whatever steps they needed to take on their own to remain out of poverty. More than 50 years later, this war continues. It has not been a success, except for a few stories here and there. Instead of people escaping poverty, America has had generation after generation enslaved to government handouts. There are more poor Americans now than in 1965, and the percentage is roughly the same. Programs for food stamps and free school lunches and breakfasts have been created and continue to grow. On the positive side, some people on government welfare seem to live better than people with low wage or part-time jobs. The results of the war on poverty have not matched the plan. America also has seen plans from the other party, the Republicans. In 1994, they produced a contract with America. Many Americans agree to the contract by voting Republicans into office, giving them a majority in our Congress. But the results never matched what was planned or promised. To mention a couple of the points from the contract, all laws that apply to the rest of the country were supposed to apply to Congress. That has not happened. They have no mandatory retirement age. You can see that in some of our leaders now. And they are exempt from what is known as Obamacare. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure they never cut their committee staff by one third as the contract called for. And I am certain they can still raise taxes without a three-fifths majority. No, those who proposed the contract were never successful in implementing their plan, and it has long since been forgotten by most Americans. I suspect you could find the same thing in Britain, plans from the government that didn't match the results. Is that, am I wrong? No. <laughs> There is a simple reason why such best laid plans go astray. The results depend on human beings going along with the plan or responding in certain ways. But human beings seldom go along with plans, even their own sometimes. In the lesson from Isaiah, we see that God had a plan. He was going to plant a vineyard and it would produce fruit, sweet grapes that would be good to eat and would produce good wine. Instead, the vineyard yielded wild grapes, which Anne's version that she read said bad grapes. Okay, the Hebrew actually says wild grapes. Now, I've never seen the fruit of wild grapes. I've seen lots of other wild berries, such as strawberries and blueberries, and they have always been sweeter than domestic varieties. Wild grapes are said to be edible, but considering how much time I have spent in the woods at all times of the year, it strikes me as odd that I have never seen that fruit. So perhaps they're not as productive as domestic vines. I know that grape vines become more productive when they are pruned rather severely. We had a grape vine behind the manse in Milliken, Colorado. It produced the most grapes after we learned to cut it almost down to the ground. We thought we were gonna kill it, but it actually produced pretty good grapes. Since no one goes out and prunes wild grapes, they're probably much less productive. And that seems to be the point here. This vineyard, which in fact was Israel and Judah, has simply not produced what God wanted, justice and righteousness. These two qualities are actually inseparable in God's plan. Righteousness means living in the proper relationship with God. It would be, it would include a proper understanding of who God is, creator, sustainer, redeemer, judge, etc. And it would include who we are, God's creation, creatures made to glorify God and worship him while living in a state of unmerited favor or grace. That has always been God's plan for human beings from the very beginning. Justice would be the application of God's will to our daily living and to our interaction with the rest of creation, especially other people. And this justice would be applied equally to everyone, 
with no special privilege or punishment given to any individual or group. But when God looked for justice and righteousness in his vineyard, instead he found bloodshed and a cry. Now obviously we can see the contrast between what God looked for and what he found. But in the English translation, we miss the play on words of the Hebrew. God looked for justice, mishpat, but found bloodshed, mishpach. He looked for righteousness, tzedakah, but found an outcry, Saaka. In both cases, it is a difference of only one letter. Righteousness and justice. Among most people, these two qualities are in short supply. They always have been. The Genesis story about the fall of Adam and Eve and all the subsequent stories about human sin represent the state of the entire human race. From the beginning, it was God's desire to have a close relationship with people. And it was his desire for people to live in proper, healthy relationships with one another. That failed to happen almost as soon as God tried to establish it. God's call to Abraham and the story of Moses and the law describe part of God's effort to restore or adapt his plan for justice and righteousness in the human race. He established the nation of Israel to provide an example to the world as well as an eventual conduit of grace through Jesus Christ. God had a plan to make his people Israel an example for the nation. But time after time, first in one way and then another, the people did everything they could to foil God's plan. He didn't want them to have a king like other nations. Nevertheless, they insisted on having a king. He warned them how kings would behave. And sure enough, the kings did not work out as well as the people had hoped or planned. Various kings led them into all kinds of trouble. In a dispute over the throne, they divided the nation. Not part of God's plan. They neglected the law of Moses. They neglected proper worship of the Lord. And they led the nation into idolatry and worship of other gods. They oppressed the poor and allowed or encouraged dishonest business practices. <clears throat> Sometimes priests and official prophets participated in this bad leadership as well. The very people whom God placed in positions of responsibility and leadership failed completely to execute God's plan, even after he had mo modified it to satisfy some of their demands. God's vine became wild. It did not produce the fruit he had planned for it. The results were quite different from the plan. He was going to have to destroy the vineyard. Where we live in America, floods sometimes inundate farm fields. And when that happens, the plants are ruined and the crop must be replanted if there is time. God would have to replant his vineyard. The results did not fit the original plan, so it became necessary to modify it. In Jesus Christ, we see God's ultimate plan for establishing justice and righteousness. We have righteousness given to us through the death of Jesus Christ. As Paul writes, our faith in Christ, that is, trusting that, he, that what he did counts on our behalf, our faith in Christ is reckoned to us as righteousness. It is as if it were simply taken from Christ's account and put into ours. It is a gift. A gift we have done nothing to earn or deserve. That seems like a really good plan from our point of view. We can have our sins forgiven and establish a relationship with Almighty God, the creator of the universe. 
He has done all the heavy lifting in this plan, giving his son to die a horrible death on the cross to provide forgiveness for our sins. Just think about all the people in the world who don't want to be part of this plan. Our New Testament lesson seems rather contrary to this plan. Jesus talks about bringing division on earth, not peace. He talks about division within families. Father and son against each other, mother and daughter against each other, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law against each other, in-laws divided. When we read those verses, our minds sort of recoil at that. That's not the way we think of Jesus. He's the Prince of Peace. One of the fruits of the Spirit is peace. I have seen numerous plaques and needlepoint hangings that proclaim Christ is the head of this house, the unseen host at every meal, the silent listener to every conversation. At weddings, we talk about how Christ is the center and foundation of a solid Christian marriage and a Christian family. So where does this talk about division come from? I think it's another case of plans versus results. I don't believe it is the purposeful plan of God in Christ to bring division between any people, let alone within families. But he knows what will happen. I would not be surprised if Jesus had already seen families whose members had bitter disagreements about who he was or, or what he meant for Israel. There are a number of reasons why families experience division because of Jesus Christ. Some are understandable, and some are not. When members of certain religions, such as Islam or Judaism, convert to Christianity, their family members will often reject them completely. This is especially true when the families are very devoutly committed adherents of those religions. This is understandable. For the Jewish convert to Christianity, the family may feel as if the person has gone over to the enemy. For centuries, so-called Christians have persecuted Jews, sometimes violently. While it may be true that these so-called Christians had not the slightest idea what the Bible says about such behavior, and while it may be true that many of them were not even Christians except by an accident of where they were born, that does not alter the perception of Jews. One can understand how it would be difficult to feel congenial towards Christianity when a supposedly Christian nation murdered six million of your people while other Christian nations denied it was happening. And Muslims, well, millions of them just hate all other religions. Someone who leaves Islam for any other religion is a worse infidel than those who never followed Muhammad. Obviously, coming to faith in Christ would cause division there. More difficult to understand is the division that occurs between and among Christians, sometimes within families. And I suppose division within a family can sometimes be a microcosm of the division that exists between groups of Christians, such as denominations. Some Christian groups have little or no tolerance for anyone who does not believe even minor doctrines exactly as they do. Such Christians sometimes believe they are the only true followers of Jesus and they will be the only ones who make it into heaven. These are the ones who are the punchline of a joke about heaven. It seems a new group of arrivals is being escorted around heaven by a tour guide. They approach a large building and the guide says, here we have the Presbyterians. Inside they see people forming committees and study groups. Next he points out the Anglicans, who are drinking sherry and discussing whether they should use incense during worship. At the Methodist building, everyone is singing hymns written by Charles Wesley. And the guide puts his fingers to his lips and tells them to be very quiet as they pass the next building. These are the, and you fill in the blank here, the Catholics, the Fundamentalists, the Baptists, whoever. So these, are the, these are the Catholics. We have to be quiet now because they think they're the only ones here. 
And even though it's a joke, there's a kernel of truth in it. Some people think they have the secret formula for achieving heaven and very few others will be there. Sometimes that even happens in families. This sort of division is without excuse. Christians can disagree on a wide variety of things and yet they should still acknowledge that Christians of other opinions also serve the same Lord. We have examples of that as early as the New Testament with the disagreement between Paul and Peter as well as others. Does someone acknowledge Jesus Christ as the only Lord and Savior and do they seek to serve him? Then accept that person as a brother or sister in Christ. Work with them in mission and ministry if the occasion arises. I've had this experience with a number of people over the years. In a church where we were involved back at home in Quincy, we had strong disagreements with others about certain issues, but we agreed to put those aside and work together in mission and ministry. If other Christians reject you, despite your sincere faith in Christ, let that division be on them. It is not according to God's plan, and the division is the result of sinfulness, not righteousness. In this matter, they are yielding wild grapes. There's the third sort of division which Christ brings. It is the division between Christian believers and those who reject the grace of God in Christ, but have no particular religious beliefs. I have no clear conclusion regarding whether such a rejection is according to a foreordained plan of God or due entirely to free will or something in between. I simply know that there will always be persons who simply cannot bear to admit their own sinfulness and or their ability, their inability to overcome it on their own. Between such persons and Christians, there is bound to be division. And sometimes that occurs even within a family. I believe this is the division Jesus had in mind when he said he came to bring division. This is not the plan of God. Rather, it is a result of human sinfulness. It is a result due to human rejection of God's plan to love and redeem each human being and grant them a righteous relationship with him. It is the rejection of God's plan for people to apply that righteous divine relationship to human relationships and so establish true justice in the world. God has a plan for each of us and a plan for all of us together. Now, I harbor no illusion that we are going to fulfill any of those plans exactly as God wants. I don't believe God thinks that either. He knows us too well. Still, he has given us the means of grace to live each day a little better than the day before, or perhaps to take two steps forward in the right direction for each single step in the wrong direction. So let us hear God's word to us today and live in a way that seeks to bring our results in line with his plan. It won't be perfect, but we can be a vineyard that pleases God. Amen.